Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a project that I've done um, online groups for uh, young people with cystic fibrosis um, and this was conducted over the summer holidays and a bit after school time so that did affect it because obviously we're working in their homes so sometimes they were away on holiday and things like that so that's an adjustment we had to make. Um, yeah so should we have the next slide please? So I have pictures in this and they were all shared with uh, consent from the young people. So I'll just give you a bit of information about the group. Um, they were offered eight sessions, which were weekly at uh, half past four on Tuesday evenings. So it was sort of an accessible time for them before, um, after school, once they got back into school term. Um, quite a few of them had already um, participated in a previous group. So some of them were had been to up to 16 sessions by the time they finished. Um, there were about six regular participants who came to every session. They were aged between seven and 12 and a mix of boys and girls. The average age was about eight. They were all mainly around eight, nine. Um, and they were all under the care of the uh, Great North Children's Hospital in Newcastle. And um, so the reason that it was offered as an online art therapy was uh, the current guidelines for cystic fibrosis mean that children with this condition can't meet in person. So for infection control um, reasons, they aren't going to be able to physically be in the same space as another child with cystic fibrosis. And that means that often they've not met another child with cystic fibrosis. And this is quite unique um, compared to other conditions where they might see other children in waiting rooms or in uh, treatment facilities and they might see older children, younger children as well. But also that uh, the Great North Children's Hospital covers a very large area. So um, it goes right up to the Scottish borders. Some of them were uh, over in Cumbria around Carlisle and a few were down in North Yorkshire. So to come to Newcastle, they often travelled for up to two hours anyway for treatment. So to get them to come weekly to a session would have been quite difficult as well. And uh, I've got a little image that uh, one of the young people did, which was about seeing other children with cystic fibrosis. And she's put a giant tree between her and the other child to sort of represent how they, they don't get to connect with each other. They don't see each other past this giant tree. Um, okay, so have the next slide. So I'll just quickly go through some adjustments that I made personally for online working that uh, I found worked for me. because I've, I've done quite a few online sessions since the start of 2020. Um, so I found that I had to be more active, more directive, almost to compensate for that not being in the room. Um, and also to make sure that all the children had a chance to participate because I think in, in a, a physical session, you maybe get more children who would talk openly, might talk to each other. They might notice each other's artwork as well. And you don't get that with the online, you know, sessions. So that is something that's missing. And that meant that I had to be a little bit more um, directive, a bit more encouraging. So setting up um, opportunities for everyone to have a chance to show their artwork, to have a chance to talk. Um, also to be a bit more, I had to be quite savvy with the uh, Zoom technology because I think uh, compared to adults as well, lots of these young people were connecting to the sessions on their parents' um, technology. So they might be on a computer or an iPad that belongs to a parent and they aren't really familiar with it. So there was a lot of um, adjustments made for that as well. So there might have been things that we could have done online with using iPads to draw with and um, creating more interactive sessions, but some of those children couldn't um, engage with that just because they weren't as comfortable with that technology. Um, yeah, so part of the group was that they made goals and their goals were to spend time with other kids with CF and to have fun and feel better about ourselves. So with that in mind, I would create a themed activity that we would start with. So the structure of the session would be a warm up and a greeting and then a 
themed activity and then some time to make their own artwork and then um, an ending and we'd have reviews in between. So what I mean by the ending, so a soft ending as well, that was another adjustment for art therapy online is that it's quite abrupt an ending. When you're online, you know, you, you click leave and then you leave and that's a big difference from in person where there's that time when you're clearing up, you know, they're putting their coats on, they're leaving the room and it's all a bit more, it's an easier transition. And also to bear in mind that they're going back into, directly into their house. So they're turning off the, um, off their technology and leaving the session and then just going straight back into their family life. And we've created a space where they're, they've opened up, they've talked about some of their, some difficult thoughts and feelings and there needs to be a, transitional space there where they can readjust back into their life um so this is one of the soft endings that we did so this is um some monsters and each child had a chance to describe a monster and we all drew it and saw if we could draw the same monster so if they would say things something like um my monster has feathers and a beak and tentacles and two eyes and everyone would try and draw the same thing and it also helped a lot with group um communications so that was something else that I was very interested in with this so trying to encourage them to communicate with each other um can we have the next slide please So one thing that I noted early in sessions was the group were only communicating via or with me. And in response to the group goals, I wanted to create opportunities for in interaction as if they were in the room together. So um, that was one of the themes that we wanted to create a sense that they could connect, they could talk to each other and that they would have that feeling of being in the room together. So one group member reflected that it was amazing to spend time with the young people with cystic fibrosis and in response to this um, we started to create a story so what i'm going to do is just quickly show you their story that they made um so this is this their story was called the girl the bear and the unicorn and this is the girl and each group member would draw as they made their story together and we're really looking at collaborative working. So in order to negotiate this story, there had to be a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion over what was going to happen, what things were going to look like. And um, afterwards, once they finished their story, one of the things was that they all felt like they were together. They could be together within this story. So that blending of a physical and a non-physical space was created through this um through the story making, this art making, where in this world, this imagined world, they could all be together and interact. Um, so I'll just start the story and you can have a listen and we'll look at the pictures as well. So the girl wakes up in her pajamas with a blanket wrapped around her. She's a little bit scared and confused. Have the next slide, please. Okay. She looks around and sees that she's in a beautiful meadow. Suddenly, a unicorn appears and tells her that she's special and shows her around. So we can have the, um, that's the meadow. That was one of the young people's images of a meadow. And then we've got an image of the unicorn as well. There are other children in the meadow and they all become friends. Okay, have the next slide, please. The unicorn teaches the group to walk across rainbows to travel around. It shows them that they have invisible wings that will help them. Suddenly, a huge scary bear charges across the meadow. They're very frightened and they run onto a rainbow to get away. We've got our bear there that was made by one of our young people and a painting of what it looks like when you travel across a rainbow as well. Have the next slide, please. The bear tries to follow but his paws fall through the rainbow and he falls and cries. I'm not a scary bear. He looks so sad the group feel really sorry for him and go back. 
He says he doesn't mean to scare them. And the group teach him about his invisible wings. When he finds his wings, he's so happy, they become visible and they're huge and beautiful. So you can see the, um, the bear with his multicolored feathery wings as well. Okay, then next slide, please. The children have to leave the meadow. They're sad as they like to play and chat there, but they know that they have their wings and can visit the meadow to feel together whenever they want. This is a group portrait that one of our um, participants made and each colour and shape represents one of the group members and she's written, we are all together and she's got one that says uh, CF, one um, she's turned into a dog and an elephant and she used this to create this image of a group portrait really where they were all joined and connected. Um, and from then on, really, so that was the end of their story. And from then on, we sort of had sessions that took place in that meadow space. So we would start the session by just imagining the meadow and thinking about what colours they could see and who else was there. So we would name the other group members. And it was really to encourage that I, that feeling of we are together. We're not physically together, but we're entering into this shared imaginary space. And then they might create artworks in that space. So as if we're sitting in a meadow together and we're making artworks together. Um, and that really sort of replaced something that felt like it was missing online. And as the group were so um, keen to create these connections with each other actually having that imagined space that everyone could share in helped to um, facilitate that I think. Okay we have a next slide please. Okay. So in the final session the young people made a flower from the meadow to take away with them. They reflected on their story and shared that they saw themes of unexpectedness, with one girl stating, no one expects to be sick when they're a kid. And in our story, unexpected things happen as well. The other theme was connection. So having a space together. And they identified that the bear showed that sometimes things seem scarier than they really are. And that it's really sad to be left behind. And that was one of the main things that actually the young people brought up was that feeling of being left behind, of not being able to do things that other people could do or plans for the future as well, because they were all reaching an age um, around 10 where the, the medical staff are quite um, clear with them about what their outlook will be with their condition what they can expect in the future. This is when they start to have those quite difficult conversations and they identified that maybe that was something that the bear felt because he was left behind and he couldn't go on the rainbow with the rest of them. And um, the final one was finding out that you have wings all along and that sometimes they're invisible. So you don't know how strong or special you are. And this, theme carried on in quite a few of the um, artworks that they made. So they would make self portraits and sometimes they'd have wings and sometimes they wouldn't. And we talk, they would talk about how they didn't know that they had these wings and perhaps they could do more than they thought they could. And I think see as well, some of the feedback was that seeing what other children were doing. So we had group members who did gymnastics and there was a boy who did uh, rock climbing and um, a girl who was really heavily involved in highland dancing and some of the other group members seeing what they can do made them think well maybe I can do more things as well and those sorts of things it's different I think the feedback was that it it was different actually seeing another young person and them saying what their experience was and what they can do compared to medical staff or their parents saying that they could do it. They're actually meeting someone who has the same condition as them and seeing what they can do as well. Um, 
Yeah, so I wondered if we'd like to go back and look at some of the images in more depth, because I know I went through them quite quickly, if that's possible. So, yeah. So we had a range of uh, materials sent out to them, so each child got a um, art pack. So you can see that there's quite a lot of different materials used. So we have oil pastels here, and this was created by um, one of the girls. Um, and this was her character, so she wanted to be the main character in the story. And then the other children drew their own characters, but um, for the sake of the narrative, she was the main character. I'll go on to the next one. The, uh, yeah, so this one was the image of the meadow was created with a um, with watercolors and pencil. Um, what you can you can almost see is that this young person she drew around her hand, so you can see it almost looks like a mitten. So then um, the idea of having that meadow that she could hold, it was a space that she was holding that she had in her hand, um, and adding all the colors that she could see. So actually, in that the meadow that we went back to was quite useful for um, entering into that therapeutic space. So we had that time where we'd do some breathing exercises and we would see what the meadow was like this week, whether it was raining, whether there were new colours, what was going on in the meadow. And that was a nice entrance into the sessions as well. Um, and then we've got the unicorn. This one was made um, using pens as well so the unicorns really became this idea of uh, something to guide you as well through the sessions of the next one um so this one was created using um paint as well um and lots of sort of splashes of color and this idea of transitioning through each other so yeah, so so moving around together. Um, and then there's the bear as well. So the way we ended up with the story was from one of my themes. So I prompted them not to create a story, but to imagine a space where we could all be together. And really the story developed quite naturally from there. So they would um, each draw something and there would be a lot of participation in terms of talking. So this really moved us away from the young people talking to me and then me replying back to the group. So sometimes someone would say, can I share what I want to do? And they'd be directed to me. So instead they would be talking to each other. So it would be, while we're in the meadow, what if this happened? What if that happened? I've drawn this, what do you think of it? And there was, it shifted from it being a focus on me and then the participants to them really feeling like a group and they were taking this together and moving the story forward without any prompting from me. Yeah. Okay. We have the next one. Yeah. So we've got watercolours here and the bear with his wings as well. And I think this image of rainbows as well, something that we see a lot in the hospital. And there's, there's lots of images of rainbows around the idea of transitioning and something that's beautiful that comes out of rain. So that was a theme that they used a lot in this. Um, okay. And the feedback from the group was um, that, again, they, it was mainly about, it was amazing meeting other young people who had similar conditions. Um, one young man said, I feel better about myself than I used to because I felt like I was all alone. Um, and another boy in the group said, it was really great to meet other people who had the same thing as me and we could talk about what we were doing together. Um, yeah, so actually that's, that's I've, I've run a little bit faster <laughs> than I thought I was going to. So if we go on, so the, the um, again, because it was only that eight sessions going, creating that flower they could take away with them 
it's a bit like creating you know, a sort of transitional object that they could take away because it was quite a short intervention and we would hope to maybe do a bit more in the future and um, several of them have now gone on to one-to-one -to -one art therapy as well so there is that option for these young people as well so um thank you everyone sorry I went a little bit fast there so if anyone wants to ask any questions or see anything else that's thank you Megan that is thank you just um amazing I'm really I'm really glad we've got time for questions actually so <laughs> I know Anya is still um in the room as well so we'll wait just to see Anya pop up there she is thank you thank you both very much because that is really insightful um you know seeing the research um that you have and then seeing an example of what can, can come out of a an online group um there was a couple of questions um around um the assessment for art therapy so around whether um you know as you said Anya it's not something that everybody is suited to and just thinking about what what do you need to think about what what sort of thing would you be looking for um when you're doing an assessment of whether and how easy is that to do when it's when it's group and also that you're doing that often online as well so I don't know Anya if you've got any thoughts mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I feel um, I feel that the assessments um, definitely requires you know qu quite a lot of uh, attention anyway, um, whether it's in face to face or online situation. But but definitely online situations uh, uh, create uh, um, additional. Um, Mm, concerns just f things that that um, both therapists and and clients need need to be aware of i think what um what really um, I found in the survey from art therapists was that um, their primary concern was the safety of clients. Obviously, in case of uh, young clients that that you work with, this is even even more so uh, because their safety um, depends uh, um, not only on their relationship with the therapist, but also on how uh, parents or guardians are are involved in in their therapy process. Process. So, so I think in terms of creating uh, uh, safe spaces, um, you know, therapists often um, found, at least from what they had shared with me, was that they uh, appreciated additional uh, time and opportunities for uh, to meet uh, their clients prior to starting the sessions, almost like scheduling uh, dedicated dedicated time online really just dedicated to making sure that that we are all uh, okay in this space that the space is actually uh, safe the, there is obviously you know the at least two physical spaces if it's one to one therapy or many more spaces if it's a group therapy so it's so it's very important to to tune this um, all in uh, and 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 uh, and i guess this additional time required for preparation was something that I came across from from therapists' experience, and something that they found they they actually needed, and and they needed this out out with of of the session time. Um, so perhaps yeah, perhaps one one tip like this. Yeah, Brilliant. I think I think I found that similar as well. So I would I for each um client who came and joined the group, we had a. A sort of online session beforehand just and it was usually with a parent where I would um, talk to them about what kind of space they need how to look after their artwork how to keep it safe afterwards and and yeah really make sure that that's in place before they joined the group um, also another thing I think is that there were young people who were referred and that this team thought would really benefit from art therapy but you relying on their parents and on them either having a good internet connection or good technology or also um you know if they've if they've got quite a chaotic home life that might mean that they would really benefit from some art therapy support but it also means that that's going to be quite difficult for them to keep a schedule and to um get online at the right time and often those were young people who didn't end up engaging Great, thank you very much. Um, there's also a, a question um, 
around um sorry I'll just go to it um thinking about the soft endings you mentioned um Megan is there a way for parents carers and families involved in making that transition easier and sort of what type of conversation you're having with parents in that assessment about what that might look and feel like for children yeah I think I think making it clear that you know they ha are going to be going straight back into their um into their life so sometimes I would suggest maybe if you know if they like a warm drink or something they can just stay where they are maybe their parent could bring them a snack or something and just have a little bit of downtime after the session to replicate that idea because often um in person again you have that leaving you then might travel home you've got a bit of processing time whereas online it is that very abrupt thing so I would often yeah um, advise parents maybe that they might just need a little bit of quiet time or that could be a nice time for them to have a bit of one-to-one -one with their child if they you know if there's if they have siblings maybe that's a nice time for just to have a bit of one-to-one -one time with a parent. Um, so there's just a couple of questions coming through on the chat now. Um, I think, Megan, somebody asked about um, the, the story and how you introduced that, but I think you covered that in the presentation. So um, unless you had anything else to, to um, add to that. Um, it, there's a question around how it works with older, older children and young people. So um, I know that you have worked with teen teens um in yeah. similar groups but yeah I wondered if you could you could touch on that a little bit about how that how that works yeah I, th I think with older um older children so I, I run a group for um teenagers um there's a lot more um communication directly with them so usually they have their own email address and for them what's been a positive feedback that I've been getting is that they're in control so it's something that's just theirs and they really like the opportunity to use the technology to actually have that control over what they share and what they show so often um the cameras might be off or they use the chat function to talk to each other and that's something that seems to come out more in the older groups that they value that idea of they're in control of the space and actually they're more in control than they are in person because they can even choose to just describe their artwork or to what to share and what not to share and when to speak yeah right yeah yes i i, I can't um really relate you know to, to, to the question in terms of uh, differences for teens and children but i can share just just briefly uh you know a, a experience of this from working with, with adults and and what what we found in in the small pilot in Western Isles was that actually the adults involved they 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 really the feeling of being in control in online situation was was something that they really highlighted too, and 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 they felt more empowered uh, to to really uh, take care of their own health and well being um, through this. And I think this this was quite uh, quite evident um, when you know when some of uh, the participants actually decided to continue with um, with creative activities beyond the sessions on their own. So this was something which which they would never actually consider before. So I think this 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 actually online situation can uh, to some people it can give this um, this feeling of additional control, which which might have long term benefits for, for people, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, and there's one more question. Um, just wondering about the managing the 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 discussion online and and how it can be difficult not to interrupt and chat over the top and have lots of and just whether you had a system for that, Megan, in in the group that you did or the groups that you do. <laughs> yeah, I th I think um really for me it it's about making sure that everyone has a chance so at the beginning of the sessions you know we make a group of the agreement and um one of the things that is in there is that we try not to speak over each other sometimes it's hard because there's a delay and in, in the um audio so sometimes someone's speaking and you don't realize they've spoken yet 
Um, but I think that's where compared to in person, I'm a bit more directive. So I might say, okay, it's it's going to be your turn to speak next. And now it's going to be, so if someone's wanting to do something, right, okay, you'll go after so-and-so, but at the minute we're listening, we're listening to this person or we're looking at their artwork. So it is a bit more about managing that, which I think is is different from how you would work in person. Otherwise it can, it can end up quite muddy with everyone talking over the top and no one really gets their chance. Yeah. So that is being a little bit more directive than I would normally be. Mm. Great, thank you. Anya, do you have um, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I guess just only maybe to uh, to echo what, what you were saying, Megan, about the directiveness and perhaps uh, this additional um, need for therapy is to really uh, think things through um perhaps perhaps even more so than in face-to-face -face therapy just just imagining you know the, those situations that that might appear uh perhaps the more directiveness and 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 building um rules as, as you would normally have for group work anyway but the, but this is especially important in online uh space uh, i also found from from uh what therapists shared with me um, so 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 yes so, so so I think this this is something that that perhaps um, 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 providers and and uh, and organizations like like yourself as well uh, I guess need to be aware of in terms of building more more time uh, for therapists to uh, to really properly uh, prepare for for such such, such sessions to, to really ensure they are safe. But also what, what I maybe wanted to, to share very briefly as well was experience of, of one of the therapists um, working on, um, on the pilot study. And uh, she, she had shared that actually um, the, 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 the little disturbances that had been happening um, in the client's uh, home, like, you know, dog barking or partner suddenly coming into the room, you know, things that, that you don't really want to have, you know, in a therapy space. Uh, but she, she shared um, in this project that initially, you know, th these were things that obviously she considered as um, uh, obstructing uh, the therapy process, but she learned pretty quickly to really turn them into the benefit um, and actually to, to, to potentially use them as, um, as, um, as, as, as those little um, moments in which rapport could be built with the client uh, and sometimes the glimpses into personal life. I think this is really so challenging as well in online therapy that you get those glimpses of personal life which you normally uh, wouldn't. You, you only would if the client um, chooses to share them with you while in online spaces they, they just happen. And, and I think it's, it's really important that, um, yeah, the, 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 the therapists... Um, need to be so sen sensitive to those and there's a potential to turn them into into therapeutic moments but there's also uh they might also be challenging and and, and disturbing for therapy process so so i just feel that that delivering therapy online is really such a skillful thing to do from art therapists and just wanted to highlight this you know that i'm i'm just totally impressed by by the work you're doing Megan and other therapists working online I think it's it really depends a lot of skill and, and sensitivity thank you um just a couple of last questions um I mean sort of linked to that uh, is a, is around you know what uh, is there a need to expand what the um what the art therapy courses do, is are they covered is the is the, is working online part of what you are um your part of your training basically when and, and is that something that that needs to to change I'm just wondering if either of you know or have, have thoughts on that um it wasn't covered when I was studying um I graduated in 2019 so quite recently but before the pandemic so maybe things have changed um now but I, I think it would be really valuable because in a way just just building confidence for, for jumping into this and that it, it is okay and it usually works out quite well and I think just because it's something that we've not been trained for at all it can be quite frightening to do that 
Yes, I, I think really, really from the from the survey, um, you know, in two thousand twenty. So, so it's been a while since then. It would be really helpful to you know to find out what the art therapists feel now after having had the chance to practice online for a couple of years. You know, their experiences from twenty twenty were very fresh. But but if I I really feel from what they had shared that that they were really brilliant in in so rapidly adjusting their practice without much guidance and at this time I feel that there was a common feeling that more guidance would be really needed it was not maybe something built into art therapy programs but I think it more increasingly is well I I at least know that. Uh, uh, that's in T site University there will be a, a module on online art therapy um uh, which I was invited to 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 join a, as a tutor so 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 there are those initiatives uh, I think going on and more awareness of, of training um but 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 yes but but I was really quite inspired how art therapists adapted you know their own practice just based on um I guess some ad hoc, you know, solutions at this time, like like really speaking with uh, peer uh, therapists, with um, with their supervisors. I think supervision was something that they had highlighted was was really important at this time. But right now, after you know several years of online practice, I think we can we can count more and more on more uh, formal uh, guidance and uh, formal training that's been slowly, I think, developed. Brilliant. Thank you. There's just a couple of people in the chat have said that they have just come to the end of their art therapy masters and all of the their personal therapy was online. And I suppose that's something else that has changed quite a lot is the fact that over COVID, obviously, their the learning and education was online as well. So it was a different a different experience. And then somebody has Vicky had mentioned that she's training at Brunel. Uh, and we do not have we do have a focus on art therapy in the post human world. Uh, it's very important um, in this changing world. So um, we've still got a bit of time. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask uh, another another question that that's come in around just the the use of art materials with online group versus in person group and and how you encourage that and the sort of differences you find when using art materials when you're with someone versus online and whether there's anything you know helpful there to think about. Um. I think one of the things that I've noticed is um, that you they're less inclined to make a mess because they're in, you're in your own home um, and you know there's there's not that feeling of freedom. It does seem a little bit more confined. It tends to be uh, the dry materials, pens, pencil, paint, but in quite a controlled way. And I think that's that just comes from being at home and you know you're you're sitting at the a kitchen table or at your mum's desk or something and whether you feel like you can just let go and create a mess and do things so often it is a bit more controlled a bit more confined to the page um also not being able to see the artwork often as it's being made so i usually ask to see things every now and then as that so I just get glimpses as things make because you do miss that the action you can you can see if someone's moving a lot if someone's being very controlled but you don't get that actual eyes on the artwork as it's being made until the point where they you know hold it up and show you yeah Yes, I, I think you, you've touched on a, on, on a, such an important thing, uh, Megan, something that, that I would really love to um, find a solution to or, or um, I don't know, at least research some solutions. You know, I, I was actually considering um, considering um you know an an option of installing additional cameras you know for therapists to see this is obviously very tedious and and you know and 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 quite uh, <laughs> disturbing personal space for um for participants and and clients but 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 yeah but i think the uh, the the really the, the the difference of online art therapy of not seeing uh, the artwork being created or not at least as frequently as uh, as something that really changes the, the the dynamic for the therapist and the client and, and something very specific that, that therapists need to be um, mindful of. 
Um, however, it also comes back to this being in control. Uh, and I think this is quite an important aspect as well, that it gives this um, opportunity for the client to actually be in control of this moment that they actually want to share in terms of where the artwork uh, is at this particular point. So I, I feel, you know, this, this, this has lots of challenges, this requires a very different approach, I think, from a therapist. Potentially, it has some advantages in, uh, you know, in giving the client um, more control on, on how they want their therapy to, 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 to develop. But, but it's a very, um, yeah, very complex subject. Also, in the pilot that, that I conducted, we were really, um, we were really fortunate to to be able to have the resources uh, uh, to buy art materials, which were sent as art packs to 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 our clients who participated in the pilot. So obviously, this is something to to be mindful of um, that if a therapy happens in a personal space, um, you know that that's that's just uh, not a not an obvious thing. The thing that people would have access to art materials, and and this might obviously increase costs. Uh, either for them or or for um, therapists or organization that provides therapy. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to pick up on something you mentioned as well about, I think it was in around the, the review that you did, um, Anya, around the use of other technology within within art therapy online. So, that, for example, I know um, Megan uses whiteboards, so it's <clears throat> something that everybody is, contributing to and, and I think your research touched on on that and that, that possibly we don't know what's coming yet I suppose either in terms of of other things I just again I wondered if if you could comment on that yes yes sure uh, there there's you know the the the, the there are um, there's some evidence in research of um, of art therapists trying to work with software developers to develop, uh, you know, even um, software which would be uh, more suitable to 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 art therapy use than than things which which had been developed for. Mm, I don't know, for digital graphics and then things like this, which tend to be used currently because there's nothing better, there's nothing more suitable for art therapy practice. And also, you know, there have been attempts in, in the US mm, from quite a while ago, from about 20 years ago, actually, um, or probably even before then, um, when, um, when a specific software was tried in a group, uh, setting so it's so, you know there, there has been thinking about this for a while but here we are 20 something years uh, after those initial you know um, um, uh, initial um, documented uh, evidence um, evidence of, of this activity and we still don't have a uh, software specific to to art therapy and I think this is this is something which which really should uh, should move on and also give you know um also because there are other new technologies that come into art therapy world and this is uh, virtual reality um, this is the use of generative uh, artificial intelligence as well so there are there are really new technologies that i think we should be aware of in in addition to to working online so they can obviously go in tandem and, and, and being utilized while working online but they can also be utilized in a in a physical space so Yes, yeah, so I think that there is lots, uh, uh, lots going on, and and lots of changes ahead, and um, I think we should we should all brace for it and just stay perhaps as informed as we as we can, um, you know, to make sure that those changes uh, are positive for practice rather than, um, you know, uh, disturbing the practice that's happening. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, we've um, just finished a couple of minutes early, but I just want to say thank you so much for sharing that. And you both happy if anyone would like to get in touch to, you know, either ask about what's happening with the with the groups or with anything that you touched on in your research. Um, that would be amazing. We will send on links and we'll send on the presentations and the recording of this so people have it to reflect back on. Because I certainly think there, there was a lot in there. So I'm sure people will maybe want to, to rewatch it again. Um, I just wanted to to highlight a couple of things. Uh, there is a session this afternoon, which um, Dr. Patricia Watt is running, which is also around an, an online project, Megan, that you are also involved in, um, which is around working with GIA patients. And it focuses also around that support 
supporting families and children at the same time. So again, that was um a digital work. So if you if people are particularly interested, that session this afternoon might also be of relevance. And it was just when you touched on VR, um, we as part of the the Teapot Trust Garden, um, moving up to Glasgow Children's Hospital, we've created a, a virtual reality version of the garden that was down to be used in the hospital and have a work is working with one of our art therapists there um, sorry art therapists um who has particular interest and experience with with vr work so if anybody's particularly interested in in seeing what's happened and um, that's not part of the conference but again happy for people to get in touch with me if they would like more information so we're just going to finish for lunch um we are due back at um quarter to two so I'd just like to finish this half of the day by saying thanks again to to all the speakers this morning it's been a fantastic session so thanks again thank you Oz.